I just want to say before I get started, what a great honor it is for me to be um, giving a lecture series at St. Nersa Seminary, um, which where, where people such as um, uh, Daniel Serpazan and Roberta Irving and Abraham Terrian have taught. Um, these are people who not only uh, inspired me and gave me a vision for what my uh, academic and um, uh, scholarly career could be looked at from afar, but also um, played a mentoring sort of role in my life throughout grad school. And um, it's almost a little bit surreal to be here at St. Nurses now and offering a lecture series. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge how meaningful uh, that is for me. So <clears throat> this um, series is going to take place, um, uh, God willing, the first half this semester and the second half next semester. And we're going to go through a bunch of the Armenian historians uh, from the fifth century uh, up until probably the early modern period. We'll see how far we get. Um, so in this first six lectures, we're going to go from around the 5th to the 10th century. Um, and I can show you here just so you have an idea of where we're headed. Uh, let's just look a little bit at the topic. So in this first, uh, in this first talk tonight, I'm going to give a general overview of the Armenian historical tradition, uh, just so that we can kind of get our uh, get grounded uh, to be able to approach these texts and understand where they're coming from. Um, in the second talk, we'll look at the conversion and early history of Christian Armenia, how that was portrayed in the works by Agathangelos and the Buzandaran Batmutyunk, Paustos uh, Buzant, the, or the so-called Epic Histories, uh, which is about the fourth century. And in the third lecture, we'll look at the, um, uh, the climactic, tumultuous fifth century, uh, the religious struggles of Christian Armenia and Zoroastrian Iran, as depicted in Ghazar of Parpi and Yerishay's histories. And then next, we'll turn to looking at Sebeos and Revant. These are two uh, very important historians, especially for Near Eastern history in general, because they are contemporary with the rise of Islam and the spread of the uh, Arab armies, the Muslim armies, uh, throughout the region, which transformed the region. And um, if, you, if, if you remember that Arabic doesn't start to be written until the ninth century, uh, these Armenian historians who are around in the seventh and eighth centuries are crucial for even understanding Islamic history uh, because they narrate uh, what was going on from their perspective. Uh, in the next lecture, we'll look at um, a certain feature that some of the Armenian historians share, which is this focus on different regions. So Thomas, Thomas Artsunik's history of the House of the Artsunik, focusing on southeastern Armenia, Vasuragan, and the Artsuni family, or Movzas of Dasvaran's history of Caucasian Albania. And in the last lecture, we'll look in the at the 10th century, looking back at the end of the first millennium. The 10th century was a period where many different histories were written, and there was an incredible, incredibly notable uh, focus on ancient, the ancient period and origins. And we'll look at how the narration of the distant past, um, how that was meaningful and uh, relevant for the contemporary events in the 10th century. But this, in this first lecture, I'll try to whet your appetite to um, these texts in general and try to make a case for uh, why we should give our attention to them at all. So oh, an overview of the Armenian historical tradition. Of the thousands of texts and manuscripts composed in Kudapar, Old Armenian, the literary form of the Armenian language in common use during the approximately 1500 years spanning the beginning of the fifth century to the second half of the 19th. It is the histories that are some of the most popular and have attracted the most attention, both from the scholarly community as well as general readers. If one were asked to think of texts in Kodapad, apart from Grigor of Nadek's prayer book, 
what would most readily come to mind for most of us might be texts such as Movses Khodanatsi's History of Armenia, which tells the ancient and mythic history of Armenia from the dawn of the world up until the fifth century. Or perhaps Agathangelos's history on St. Gregory, St. Seripsime and Gayane, and the conversion of King Terdat's court and the Armenian realm to Christianity. Or perhaps Yelishay's history of Vartan and the Armenian war, which tells of the heroic resistance of Vartan Mamigonyan and his companion warrior saints who fought and died to defend the Armenians' right to practice Christianity when the Sasanian Persian Empire sought to impose the imperial religion of Zoroastrianism upon them. These are the texts which, with the exception of the Bible and perhaps a few other works, have most influenced the way in which Armenians, specifically Armenian Christians, have understood their identity, their place in the world in relation to other peoples and powers, their cultural, moral, and religious value system, their past, present, and future. Looked up from afar, the ancient and medieval Armenian historical tradition can be perceived as a unitary whole, since writers often viewed themselves as continuing the work of their predecessors, updating the Armenian historical record with the story of their own times. The first to do this was Lazar Parpetsi, writing less than 100 years after the invention of the alphabet, around the year 500, who says his own history is the third to be written, coming after that of Agathangelos and the anonymous author of the epic histories, Pastos Buzant. Later writers follow Lazar's lead, mentioning often by name their historiographical predecessors. Let's look uh, right now at a couple examples from the medieval period. So these are lists composed by later historians who mention the, the previous histories that they'd read and whose works they're continuing. So Stephen of Dodon, Stepanos Dodonetsi in the early 11th century mentions Agathangelos, Mopsas of Choren, Yerishe, Razar, Pastos Buzant, Sabeos Ravont, uh, Shapu Bagratuni, which is now lost, John the Catholicos, and himself continuing this. We're going to look at most of these uh, in future sessions of this course. In the 13th century, you can see from Giragos Gansaketsi an even more complete list, very similar to Stepanos's in the first half. Um, but with a few uh, other ones added in, and then also ones that, that came after Stepanos Dodonetsi. Um, and other such lists can be found in other historians and chroniclers like Samuel of Ani, 12th century, Mechitar of Ani, or Mechitar of Aydivan. Inspected more closely, the Armenian historical tradition, one may narrow in on the differences that mark out each author and text from the others and see each on its own terms with its own specific preoccupations and biases related to the individual perspectives of each author, the reason that motivated the writing of his history and or the patron who commissioned the work. So we'll try to do a little bit of both in this series of lectures, oscillating between the macro level and the micro level the unity of the tradition as a whole, and what are common to these texts in general, which is the topic of this lecture, and the particularities of each individual work. In some ways, we could consider the Armenian historical tradition as being continuous up until the early modern period, when it was brought together and recapitulated in the Mechitaris father, Mikhail Chamchian's monumental history of Armenia, Batmutun Hayots spanning over 2,000 pages in three hefty volumes. Look at the title even. History of Armenia from the beginning of the world to 1784 AD. So in these over 2,000 pages, he brings together and kind of synthesizes all the various Armenian histories who'd come before him into one great monumental work. And of course, this was the Mechitaris. They had all the manuscripts and all the previous histories at their disposal. After Chamchian, after 1784, Armenian historians and scholars became much more conscious and in step with the norms governing the modern discipline of history. 
Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. I'm just I've just been told that the slide is not the slides aren't going. Um, okay, sorry about this, everyone. Can you please go up to the previous slides that we didn't see? Yes, I've just been told that um, you weren't seeing the slides, although I will do that. Give me just one second here. It is working now? Okay, so let me see. Can, can you? So tell me, are you seeing the second slide now? We're seeing slides that show the list of the lectures, the dates, lecture one through two, three, Thank four, five, that. six. Okay, so that's what I was saying before. Here's the title. <laughs> and then uh, here's the wonderful slide showing uh, all these beautiful title pages of Tax and Karafar. Um, this is showing that about the unity of the tradition, how Ghazar uh, consciously knew of Pastos Buzant and Agathangalos and called his history the third. And then here's these lists. So this is good. So um, if you're watching this later on YouTube, you know, this could be like paused and you could copy it down if you wanted, or I'll send it to you if anyone writes to me. Um, okay, and here's where we were. So this is Mikhail Chamcham's history in the great three volume work, 2000 plus pages. Uh, thank you for alerting me to that. I'm sorry uh, about that. Okay, so after Chamchian, Armenian historians and scholars became much more conscious and in step with the norms governing the modern discipline of history as it was being developed by scholars in Western European countries like Germany, France, England, and Italy. Soon after Chamchian, the world began to change in dramatic ways we don't have time to go into fully now. And even the beautiful literary standard in which this great tradition was composed right up through Chamchun's own work, soon fell into disuse and obsolescence. Thus, we find ourselves in a situation today in 21st century America, where we are largely cut off from this literary heritage, alienated as it were from our natural birthright. Some of us don't read modern Armenian comfortably or at all, let alone Kurapar, old Armenian. As for translations of the works, many of us don't even know what's out there, let alone where to find them. And then again, even if we could get a good translation, some of us are probably under the impression that books from so long ago would be outdated or difficult to understand, even boring. And besides, there's plenty else to capture our interest and attention and entertain us in the little free time that most of us have. So it's in light of all this that I've composed the following goals for this series. So let's look at these together. So. My hope is that everyone who follows these series will become familiar with the major ancient and medieval Armenian histories and historians, and that we'll be able to remove barriers to understanding them by becoming acquainted with the context in which and the purpose for which the histories were written. And we can do that by understanding the social, economic, political, and religious factors involved in the production of a history. And it's my further goal that I will um, let you know and give you uh, uh, documents that will guide you to be able to find the sources, publications, and some scholarly studies that might be of interest so that you'll be able to acquire the text and read them independently if you so choose and desire. And because you have to read these and to experience them and appreciate their value. And anyone who has read has read them uh, knows what I mean. <laughs> and if you if you haven't, my goal is to capture your interest. So that's why my personal goal for myself is to introduce these Armenian histories in such a way that those present will want to go out and read them. So let's see if I can do that in the remainder of this talk. From the history textbooks of elementary school, most high school, and some college curricula, 
We form the impression from an early age that history is a record of the past, of what actually happened. Textbooks are full of dates and figures, maps and timelines, and innumerable details that tend to be presented in a somewhat dry and boring third-person narrative voice. It narrates and communicates facts in a way that aims to be impersonal, disinterested, almost invisible, thus underscoring its objectivity. When one opens the pages of a medieval Armenian history, by contrast, one enters a very different textual world, narrated by a very different kind of authorial voice. Here we encounter an epic world of warring empires with kings and queens, nobles and peasants, heroes and traitors, priests and magi, angels and demons, prophets and soothsayers, sorcerers, villains, wonder workers, saints and martyrs, dramatically and colorfully depicted in the way only a great storyteller can, one who is invested in the story, who was there when it happened, or knows intimately those who were. It's as if the historian is in the room there with us, influencing how we think and feel about each of the characters and playing on our emotions, just like the music scores of movies direct the emotional responses of the audience. But why such a great disparity from the history we're used to in school and these old Armenian historians? In part, this has to do with the way the modern discipline of history developed. And it would help to say just a few words about that. From the 19th century to the present, we can observe the modern discipline of history struggling and oscillating between two poles. On the one hand, the quest to narrate the past objectively. On the other, the subjectivities of the historian influenced by his or her own values and culture. It's almost superfluous to say that most historians aim to present as holistic and accurate a picture of the past as possible, harnessing all the tools at their disposal in order to do so. Such tools have become progressively more rich and sophisticated over time as new disciplines have arisen to supplement and aid the historian's task. Beyond archival literary sources, the historian now has access to philological and linguistic studies, the archeological record, art and material culture, and the findings of ethnography, sociology, and anthropology. By carefully balancing and evaluating all of the above material, the contemporary historian is poised more than ever before to present an objective picture of the past. It's a desire for such objectivity that guides the compilation of most textbooks and hence their features as described previously. Despite all this, Somewhat ironically, it is today more than any other period of modern history when historians are most conscious of their own subjective biases and the impossibility of escaping them. That there's no such thing as objective history is now an adage in the field. Each historian is motivated by his or her own subjective agenda and biases, which influences what they deem important and select for inclusion in their history and how they present it to the reader. Such subjective biases vary from generation to generation and from person to person. For much of the 19th century, nationalism influenced the agenda of most historians, as history was regularly put to use in order to serve the agenda of the coalescing nation states that wanted to canonize their past in order to glorify the modern nation and form citizens. This approach still has its effect in our own world today to a greater or lesser degree in different parts of the globe. Other intellectual and cultural trends influence subsequent periods, such as Marxism, with its focus on social classes and the pervading influence of economics governing all aspects of history. Marxism, of course, dominated historiography in the Soviet Union, as well as certain Western universities up until the present day. There's social history, which focuses on the lives and experiences of ordinary people, rather than the great men approach that dominated political histories for centuries. Or the new left historians, which beginning from the 1960s and continuing with the various post-colonial and post-modern approaches make class, race, gender, sex, or power the lens through which all aspects of the past are evaluated and interpreted. Or there is world or global history, 
which focuses on the examination of history from a global perspective and looks for common patterns, networks, and exchanges that emerge across and transcend individual cultures and geographical regions, borders, and boundaries. It is in part the awareness of the subjectivity of all history that has given rise to these various subfields, wherein scholars openly state their research agenda, including their biases, preoccupations, and subjective interests at the outset of their study. Interestingly, this actually aligns contemporary historians closer with their ancient and medieval counterparts, who in general state the reasons and purposes for which they are writing their history in the prologues that open their works. Ancient historians were aware that to a greater or lesser degree, subjective interests guide the approach of everyone engaged in the writing of history, and they found no reason to hide their own or pretend they didn't have any. So what were the purposes, preoccupations, biases, subjectivities, and agenda of Armenian historians? What motivated them to pick up the pen and write the great works we now have? In this next portion of the lecture, I would like to speak about the Armenian historical tradition in general, making several disparate but related points that will help orient us before we look more closely at individual histories in future sessions of the series. The first thing that needs to be said is that the Armenian historians were all Christians, writing within a biblical Christian worldview. The alphabet, we recall, was invented at the turn of the fifth century with the express purpose of aiding the evangelistic agenda of the new religion by translating the Bible, as well as theological, liturgical, and other texts into Armenian. The authors of the Armenian histories tended to be from the ecclesiastical or monastic ranks and thus immersed in Christian literature. As examples, we could name John of Draschanagert, the 10th century Catholicos, Stephen Orbelian, the 13th century Archbishop of Sunik, Uchtanas, 10th century Bishop of Sebastia, or Yerishe Vartabed, Razar of Parpi, Vartan Aravelsi and Giragos Kansakatsi, who belonged to the monastic class. Their moral and metaphysical assumptions were shaped by the Bible and Christian philosophy. And the Bible also provided literary models that some historians borrowed when composing their own works. Thus, Yerishe depicts the Vartanank fighting against the Sasanian Zoroastrians in defense of their ancestral traditions after the manner of the Maccabees whose stalwart defense of their Jewish faith and traditions against the Seleucids is the subject of several biblical books. Likewise, in the 11th century, Aristarchus Lastaverzi borrows from the Deuteronomic historian and the prophetic books of the Old Testament to account for the Seljuk invasions and the destruction of Armenian cities, claiming those calamitous events were a result of divine judgment for the people's sin. Next, we must also know a bit about the political and cultural situation of ancient Armenia, which shaped and influenced the Armenian histories as the tradition was being formed. And I'm gonna be brief here um, because as you know, from those of you who have been following previous iterations of this series, there's excellent lectures on YouTube about the Armenian, uh, Christian, Armenian Christian history from the early period onwards. Um, that Professor Roberta Irving has done, and those are posted on YouTube on the St. Nursa Seminary site. I'll share the links with everyone after in a document I've prepared for, for everyone. So I'll go through this briefly, but if you want more detail, you should go there. So from the time of the Achaemenid Persian Empire in the sixth century BC, Armenians were part of the Iranian cultural and religious world. Beginning in the first century AD, the royal house over Armenia, the Arsacids or Arshakuni, were relatives of the Parthian kings who ruled over Iran. In 224 AD, the Sasanians overthrew the Parthians and took control of Iran, thus turning the Arshakuni kings of Armenia into sworn enemies of the Sasanians. The conversion of King Turdat and the royal entourage to Christianity only made relations between Armenia and Iran worse. During this 
general period known as Late Antiquity, Armenia was a contested realm between the East Roman and Sasanian empires, culturally more akin to Iran, yet religiously affiliated with the Roman Empire since the beginning of the fourth century. And it's always helpful to look at maps. So this, if you could really zoom out, you would see how enormous uh, the Persian Empire is, which is to the Southeast and the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire to the West in purple. Armenia's the space in the or orangish sort of color. Um, so in, the, in 387 AD, another one of the key dates we should remember, a partition was arranged by which about four-fifths of Armenia remained in the Sasanian Empire, while the areas west of the Euphrates River passed under Roman control. Soon after that, as we know, the alphabet was invented in 404-405. In 428, the Arshakuni kingdom falls at the request of the Armenian Nahararz and a governor is put in place over Armenia by the Sasanians to govern in the name of the Shah. Zoroastrian Mazdaism, being the state religion of the Sasanian Empire, uh, the empire tried to impose that religion on the realm of Armenia that lay under its control, fearing that Armenia's Christian commitments made it a natural ally of the Roman Empire. And you know the rest of the story, how the climax came at the Battle of Avaraj, when the leading Armenian family of the era, the Mamigonians, led their military resistance against the Sasanians and the other Armenian noble families who'd accepted Zoroastrianism and were fighting on the Sasanian side. Religious freedom was finally granted in 484 and a kind of modus vivendi was reached whereby Armenians were able to maintain their religious commitments to Christianity while politically remaining loyal to the Sasanian empire. The significance of all these events for our purposes here is to realize that the Armenian historical tradition takes shape after Christianization, after the end of the Arshakuni kingdom, after Avaraj and the wars of the fifth century, and is highly, highly marked by all these dynamic processes transforming Armenian society. Given that the vast majority of historical works issue from clergymen, writing from the portions of Armenia under the Iranian sphere, who view themselves and their church as persecuted by the Sasanian overlords, it should come as no surprise to learn that there is an anti-Iranian, anti-Zoroastrian, and pro-Christian, pro-Roman bias in many, though not all, of the historical works. Some of the main questions the early historians have to answer are the following. How can Armenians combine their Christian traditions with political loyalty to a non-Christian state? How are they to remain a people when they are divided between different empires? How are they to reconcile their new faith with their culture and traditions that predate their acceptance of Christianity? And we'll see how they offer answers to some of these questions. Related to the above point, we should be aware when we open the pages of an early Armenian history of how new and unusual an experience it would have been to do just that, to open a book in the time when such histories were first written. Up until the fifth century, and indeed in many sectors of society after, Armenia was and remained a largely oral society. We can hardly imagine what this would have been like since we live in a world inundated with the written word, not just in books, but on signs and billboards and nearly everywhere we look. Before the historians, Armenian literature was largely comprised of oral traditions and oral literature, songs, epics, legends, and lore transmitted by gusans, poet performers, and belonging to the pre-Christian, pagan, or Zoroastrian belief systems. The Zoroastrian religion itself was primarily oral, its sacred texts not even written down until about the sixth century AD, over a millennium after some of them were first composed. As the Armenian historians looked to tell of the things they deemed important in their own times, they naturally looked to biblical models as well as Greek and Syriac written literary models. 
So Eusebius's Ecclesiastical History and Chronicle, Josephus's historical works, and the writings of later ecclesiastical historians, as well as the acts and lives of the apostles, martyrs, and saints, became generic templates by means of which Armenians wrote themselves into sacred history, inscribing themselves and their world into the larger universal Christian story that told of the workings of God and his people in the world. It was the fundamental belief of Armenian historians that God's wondrous deeds did not end with the Bible, but that he acts in the same way with all peoples who bear the name of Christ, even and especially the Northern nations, as Armenians often describe themselves following biblical usage and geography. But the historians also made use of and competed and contended with the oral tradition and its literature. Many episodes in the Buzandaran, Paustos Buzand, for example, shared generic similarities with Iranian epic and some of the Armenian histories, notably Movses Khodanatsi, transmit oral compositions that give us a taste of what must have been a vast literature that existed in the air and atmosphere all around the written texts. Caustic references in the early historians to the songs, legends, and epics Yerk Araspel Vibasanutun, cherished by the general population, give us a glimpse into the competitive and combative encounter between the new Christian written literature and the oral older one. The Armenian historians set themselves up in opposition to the bards and singers of the old world, who praised and enshrined in immortal memory the heroic valor, Kachutun, of noble warrior lords, the supernatural glory, Park of the King, and other such themes. By means of a creative and original synthesis, the Armenian historians invite their readers to inhabit a newly imagined literary and religious world that takes the people's natural and native beliefs and terminology and merges them with the picture of God and reality that derives from the Bible and early Christian literature. In so doing, they invested with new meaning some of the key terms of the old literature and its value system. So kachutun, which was formerly reserved for the valorous deeds of heroes and nobles, was applied to the mighty deeds and accomplishments of Christ and the saints, who are God's champions. Likewise, park, which denoted the transcendental glory accompanying and protecting the legitimate king of Iran in the Zoroastrian tradition, was reformulated by the Christian writers and applied to the royal supernatural attribute of God and his saints. Another point to make is that the works of most Armenian historians were commissioned by a patron. The patron, naturally, had his or her, usually his own purposes and agenda for which they wish the history to be written. Several of the early histories, such as Ghazars and Yelishes, were commissioned by Mamigonian noblemen, and thus not only reflect that particular family's viewpoint, but go out of their way to honor and glorify the family. Movses Khodanatsi does the same for the Bagratuni, Thomas Artsruni for the Artsruni of Vasparagan. So in addition to their other purposes, many historians wrote to promote the reputation of and immortalize the glory of the princes and patrons who commissioned them. They look to leave behind a memorial of their good, noble, and heroic deeds to be remembered by later generations. Thomas Artsruni and Movses Khodanatsi specifically mention this purpose uh, for their writing. And Movses Khodanatsi's is the quote that gives its name to the title of this series. So when we consider Armenian histo histories and historians or pick one up to read, one of the first questions we should ask is, who commissioned it and why? And we'll do that together with each one in this session, in this series. So one major theme we could point out at the beginning that stands out in some of the historians is the importance of unity. Armenians were always caught between different empires and being asked to serve the agenda of that particular empire in exchange for personal reward for doing so. This often ran counter to the good of the nation as a whole, as the historian saw it. 
Indeed, when the unity of the Armenian princely families was broken, resistance to foreign powers tended to quickly crumble. And Armenians, just like today, were almost never united. You could easily argue that one of the common themes of Armenian existence throughout history is the chronic inability of their leaders in the early period, this is the Armenian noble families, to coordinate their policies in a harmonious manner that works toward the good of the people at large. This is a major theme, for example, in the history of John the Catholicos in the 10th century. One of his principal purposes for writing was to try to get the noble families to unite together instead of pursuing the individual interests of their family. The classical formulation of this theme is found in the history of Yerishe, where not just individual, but collective moral virtue and unity is one of the principal themes of the work. For Yerishe, Armenians are identified as the Christian people of God, and their collective survival depends on their unity with one another and their faithfulness to the church and Christian covenant. Abandoning God in the church means treachery to the Armenian people, self-sabotage, and national suicide. Yerishe's depiction of Armenians as the persecuted people of God struggling against an evil overlord became one of the root metaphors that informed the Armenian interpretation of their own existence in the world, first under the Sasanian Zoroastrians, then under the Arab Islamic Caliphates, then under the Seljuk and then Ottoman Turkish rulers. This perspective has become so fundamental to the Armenian literary as well as lived experience that it is hard to remember that it did not really exist as such before Yerishe invented it in his history. In a future lecture, we'll explore just how tenuous the situation was when Yerishe was writing and how many Armenians of the time viewed things differently than him. Armenian historians in general thought of their writing as having a moral instructive purpose. As the late Robert Thompson observes, who translated many of the Armenian histories into English. History was the record of God's providence in the world and the reader was encouraged to follow the examples of virtuous conduct. One of the primary purposes of the histories then is to inspire readers, to encourage and instruct them how to act. Unlike school textbooks, the Armenian historians are not just trying to convey information and get their readers to know facts about the past. Because in the end, knowing about what happened is useless if it does not influence the kind of person you become. The Armenian historians seek rather to shape and form their readers, not just get their readers to know something, but get their readers to become something. They want to tell a story that will change you, your beliefs, values, and goals. For this reason, they feel no qualms about taking liberty with their material, writing speeches into the mouths of their characters, or even inventing scenes and details when it serves their greater purpose. In this way, their work shares similarities with great works of literary fiction. Some scholars have even suggested thinking of them as historical fiction, or partly fictionalized history. This is not to stress their weakness or unreliability as history, but to underscore their power to influence and shape the reader in the way that only great literature can do. If you let them, the Armenian histories can influence your mind, heart, and imagination, consuming you in a way not unlike a great medieval fantasy like Lord of the Rings, which depicts the struggle of human and other beings in a literary universe where good and evil are always clashing and the victory over evil depends on the participation of characters like you and me on the side of good. We rush to such books or movies and are gladly taken away into their worlds, so like our own, because they provide us with a clear hierarchy of values, a deep sense of meaning, and a glimpse into the fabric of reality that is often hidden from us as we get lost in the details of our day-to-day -day lives. They remind us that our mundane existence, our quotidian actions and affairs do not end with us, but are part of a grand story, the great epic of the universe, 
where all things are connected with each other and with a larger purpose, where all our actions bear great weight and carry meaning. So the historians do not narrate facts, not just because this would be boring, but because it would be useless and meaningless. As humans, we need meaning, we crave it. We need to see the larger purpose behind individual events, to see how otherwise disparate and incomprehensible events fit into a larger pattern and story. Because we don't understand events when they happen. It takes time and reflection, storytelling and narrative to give individual events meaning in relation to what came before and what will follow. In other words, events must be woven into a larger narrative in order to be understood. It's for this reason that philosophers say that events are separate from the meanings ascribed to them. There's the external event and there is its meaning, which is hidden and unknown until someone defines it and puts it into a story. What's more, an event can have multiple meanings depending on how one looks at it or how one fits it into a larger narrative. Take 9-11 as an example. What did it mean when the planes crashed into the two tall buildings at the southern end of Manhattan? Thinking and investigating collectively, it took days, weeks, months, and years to understand what that event meant, to fit it into a larger story, and to give it a coherent meaning. Early on, and to this day, there is still considerable debate and disagreement about what that event means, why it happened, although no one debates that it happened. This aspect of our lived reality is well expressed in a passage from a recent book by a contemporary psychologist and popular teacher. Events, as they lay themselves out in front of us, do not simply inform us of why they occur. And we do not remember the past in order to objectively record bounded, well-defined events and situations. The latter act is impossible in any case. The information in our experience is latent, like gold and ore. It must be extracted and refined with great effort and often in collaboration with other people before it can be employed to improve the present and the future. We use our past effectively when it helps us repeat desirable and avoid repeating undesirable experiences. We want to know what happened, but more importantly, we want to know why. Why is wisdom. Why enables us to avoid making the same mistake again and again, and if we are fortunate, helps us repeat our successes. So we need an overarching frame to give meaning to events and to our lives. The thing about reality as we experience it is that the overarching story or frame that gives events their meaning is often invisible to us at any given moment that we are acting and living in the world. It is only in the textual and narrative world of story that a skilled and inspired spirit-filled author may pull back the curtain on physical reality as we see it and set all things in relation to the spiritual metaphysical dimensions of reality, may interpret events in the context of God's reality and tell us what our lives mean and how our individual actions relate to God's overall purposes for ourselves, our people, our world, and all the universe. This is one of the fundamental impetuses guiding the Armenian historians. So they are not so much concerned with describing with perfect accuracy exactly what happened, which is often our obsession, as they are with explaining the meaning of events. They are not just describers, but interpreters of reality, inviting us to see events as they see them, informed by the biblical Christian view of providential guidance over creation and human affairs, with belief in a creator God who is the source of all things, who entered the world in order to reveal knowledge of himself and unite humanity and all creation with him, who worked wondrous deeds in the past and continues to do so through the people who live and act in the name of Christ, who invites human beings to engage on the side of good in the great battle between good and evil that constantly rages 
in the external world of human affairs and the internal world of every individual's heart, who has already won the decisive battle over evil and death and will one day come again, judge the living and the dead and set the world to rights. It's into this narrative universe that we'll enter together each evening these next five weeks. Thank you. And okay. So as promised, um, if that sounds interesting to you, what I want to give and go through briefly here is a little um, resource guide that first I'm gonna make sure I copy this. And someone can test quickly. I can also, I think, get your emails um, afterwards. Am I... Can someone just check the link in the chat to see? Yes, it worked. Working? It worked. It works. Okay, thank you, Matt. It's good. Okay. Okay, so. Um, you will all have this. So I'm. what I want to do is go through, I don't know why I'm frozen on the thing. Am I frozen for you guys? My video? Your video is black. My video is black. Okay. Hang on a second. Your video is fine for me. It's frozen, but it's not black. Now it's on. Okay, tell me, is it back now okay? Yes, yes. Okay, Okay. so let me get the screen share one more time. And for just 10 minutes, if you need to go now, that's fine. But for 10 minutes, I want to show um, a few of these resources that I've put together for you so that you can be able to actually find some of these texts and um, investigate some things more uh, on your own. So you're all seeing the screen that says bibliography, right? Okay, so uh, first of all, for anyone that wants to find like all the editions, published translations, et cetera, um, there's these resources. Uh, these, um, here you can find everything you need. And if you need, um, I can send you um, these in PDF, or if you click this link here, it'll take you to um, Robert Bedrosian's site on archive where he has helpfully collected um, basically everything you need for uh, bibliography to find all these texts and sources. And we'll be coming back to him. Um, and then these studies I found especially helpful when I was preparing which are general overviews of the early Armenian historical uh, tradition. And I can, again, share PDFs of these if needed, if you can't uh, access them. Okay, so then the big thing, in order to access Armenian texts, if you want to look at the Karapar texts themselves, the, these links will take you to the series of the Madanakir Kayots, the Armenian classical author series, where you can actually actually download PDFs of the text of basically all the Armenian historians that we're going to cover here. Um, and then if you click this link, it'll take you to the classical Armenian historical texts from the 5th to 15th centuries that, again, Robert Bedrosian has prepared. Um, these are basically books that have all been digitized by like Google or different things like that on Google Books where you can uh, download the PDFs of books and find them. And it's all arranged uh, perfectly on these documents if you just download them and then click the links to follow. Um, if you want to access English texts, what I want to share with everyone to make sure you know about, um, I actually wrote a little article about this new publication series called Sofene Books. Um, basically, it's the work of two incredibly passionate individuals um, who have taken it upon themselves to publish uh, editions of 
basically classical and medieval Armenian literature, especially focusing on the histories. And so they're largely using uh, Robert Bedrosian's translations, uh, which have been around for years online, um, updated and putting them into these uh, beautiful editions. Um, and what's so great about these is that they have the Armenian text on one side and the English text on the other. And they're really gorgeous editions, even just to, to read the paper, you know, everything. And so finally, um, people who don't have access to, you know, a university library or the place where all these rare books were kept, you can actually buy these uh, for yourselves now. And um, they're not uh, terribly expensive. So, and it would be a great thing to support so that they can keep going uh, with this work. So you can see these are pretty much all the histories that we're going to be looking at. Uh, you can actually get the text for yourself in English and Armenian. So the links uh, are here to that. Um, and then for all your needs in terms of like secondary sources, or maybe you want to look into things further on your own, um, Robert Bedrosian, who I've already mentioned several times, has um, put together so many useful um, materials that he's made available uh, through his internet archive site, um, where you can uh, look through by different topic and find, um, you know, everything you need, the best maps uh, for Armenian medieval period, ancient period, the one I showed earlier and, you know, beautiful JPEG files, high quality, different studies in, on Armenian literature, all these different topics. Um, for so many people, um, if they didn't have access to a university library, you were kind of shut out from uh, looking further into most of this uh, stuff because um, the books were inaccessible or they're so expensive. But uh, you know, thanks to all these resources we have now, you can basically go as deep as you want. Uh, and there's some of you here I know that uh, have really taken a deep dive uh, into some of this material and you probably know already uh, all of these things. Um, so then um, maps are so useful for uh, really understanding, you know, um, you really have to look at the maps to, to get a grip on everything here. And so, um, again, Robert Bedrosian has put together like these amazing PDFs of like all these incredible uh, maps from different periods, different regions. You can look through here to find what you want. The best of all is Robert Hewson's uh, Armenia a Historical Atlas that he's broken up into a bunch of files because it's so huge. And you can uh, download this and click, and click the links to get the PDFs and also the JPEG images of the, of the maps themselves. And then um, I also put on here the, um, the YouTube lectures on Armenian church history, which you can find um, in different playlists uh, so far. There's been the early period, um, the period between what, like late antiquity, coming of Islam up into the 10th century, and then um, just finished the period, the medieval period in Cilicia. And um, these are such high quality and fantastic lectures, which if you haven't been following them, you can listen to them as we go here, and you'll get a deep sense of the context as we're looking into the histories themselves. And then um, also here is just a brief description of every upcoming lecture and um, the specific like bibliography, the citation of the work itself that you can get, and when possible, if there's a link to one of the Sofene books uh, publications that you can see um, if you want to, you know, get the text for yourself, maybe you thought this one sounds really interesting or good to read and you want to get it for yourself to read, you'll have all the links and everything accessible here. And it's eight o'clock on the dot, so that's a good time to stop. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone, for your attention.